Good morning, good morning. Before I do anything, I just want to say I'm going to announce the winner of the ESV Study Bible at the end of the video, just because I like to create some dramatic suspense and tension in these videos. Welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. It is so good to have all of you here. If this is the first time watching one of my videos, I just want to extend a very warm welcome to you. And I hope that you find these videos very useful. So if you like this material, smash that subscribe button, let other people know about it, and be sure to leave a comment or a thumbs up afterwards. Mm. Now in my last video on All Saints Day, I mentioned that the lectionary schedule after All Saints Day takes on a highly what we call eschatological flavor to it. And eschatology is just simply a big fancy word that means end times. And the reason why it takes this focus on is because in two weeks we're, we are going to be having Christ the King Sunday. And on that Sunday, we celebrate or anticipate Christ's second return and his ultimate victory over the powers of evil. The second reason why we transition to an eschatological flavor is because we're going to move into the new liturgical or lectionary year in December with the start of Advent. Remember, Advent is the beginning of the liturgical or lectionary year, not January. And originally, Advent had a very end times focus to it. And I'll explain the reason for that in a couple of videos from now when I cover what is Advent all about. So stay tuned for that video. In this video, I'm jumping into Matthew chapter 25, the first 13 verses, the parable of the 10 virgins. And what is this parable all about? And what is its application to our life today? But first, we need to grab some coffee and let's dive into this passage. Now, before I get into the actual text of Matthew 25, I want to remind you that I spent most of the summer doing a series on the parables that was in conjunction with a course I taught on the parables for Fuller Theological Seminary. And I've got over 10 videos up on the parables. I have a whole playlist on that. And so you can check below this video and see those. So if you like parables on the videos, I've got a ton of them. And this is one more that's going to be added to that collection. Now the church up till 1900 really read this parable. In fact, it read all the parables in a very allegorical manner. In other words, there's a code behind the parable and you need to know the code in order to interpret the parable. So for example, some of the allegorical code that's been applied to this parable have been that the foolish virgins represent the Jews. The wise virgins represent the Gentiles. The oil that's in the lamps could represent good works, faith, love for God and for others, perseverance in the church. Origen, who lived around 300 AD, interpreted the parable that the five foolish virgins represent the five physical senses of the body. And the five wise virgins represent the five sort of wisdom senses. Now, the first thing I want to bring out is that no matter what allegorical correspondence that you bring out regarding this parable, if the people that Jesus was speaking to when he was originally teaching this, if they didn't understand that allegorical correspondence, it probably should not be considered valid at all. Starts off verse 1 by saying, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be light. But in the Greek text, it starts off with the word then, totai. And this word then connects this parable with the previous parable and the previous chapter as well. Chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew is a collection of Jesus' teachings on the end time that Matthew has put together. So the use of the word then lets us know that we are to interpret this parable in relationship to what he's just taught in chapter 24, and this brings it within the light of eschatology, or the end times. If we back up to chapter 24, at the very start in verse 3, it says that Jesus is teaching on the Mount of Olives, and he's teaching to his disciples in particular. They come up and they ask him when the end of time will occur. When will all these things take place? And as I said before, this parable should be understood by what they understand. They didn't have a highly developed allegorical code. This would have made perfect sense to them and it had an impact upon their lives based upon the story and the narrative structure that it contains. 
The second thing I want to bring out here is that if we have then at the beginning, at the very end in verse 13, we have what we call a nimshah. This is a Jewish concluding statement that the rabbis often used in their parables that summarizes or gives kind of one of the points of the parable. And in this one, it says, therefore, stay alert because you do not know the day or the hour. This once again puts this parable within a highly eschatological framework. Now, if you want to geek out a little bit, some study Bibles include a note at the very end of verse 13. And it says that some early manuscripts include the phrase in which the Son of Man comes. In other words, early copyists thought that this phrase, you don't know that day or that hour, was a little bit too nebulous. And so they added an explanatory phrase there. The earliest and best manuscripts that we have, though, do not include that phrase. And so it's best to end that with, you do not know the day or the hour. I don't know. Some of you might find that interesting. I just included it for free. I'm not going to charge you for it. So we'll just leave it at that. There's three acts to this story. So sort of three characters and three acts. In verses one through five, we have the setup and we're introduced to the virgins. They are ready and they are waiting for the arrival of the groom to start the wedding banquet. In verses six through nine, we have the announcement that the groom is approaching. And then finally, in 10 through 12, we have the arrival of the bridegroom and the entry into the wedding banquet or the non-entry into the wedding banquet. So let's take a look at these three separate acts. And I'm gonna be reading from the Net Bible, the New English Translation this week. Act one, verses one through five. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of the virgins were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take extra olive oil with them. But the wise ones took flasks of olive oil with their lamps. When the bridegroom was delayed a long time, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now this parable opens with a very common event from everyday life in Palestine and large places around the world. A wedding feast. A couple is about to get married and everything is prepared for the feast. They're just waiting for the groom to arrive. If you read different authors or devotions, you'll find a great deal of material going into how this was a two-stage wedding. They would meet at this house and go to that house where the groom went over there and then would bring the bride to this house and so on down the line. A lot of that material is not found during the biblical era. This comes from material around four to six, maybe 500 AD, and is much later than the New Testament text. We don't really know what the wedding practices were when this parable was given. So we're just gonna have to stick with what's in the text here. All that we know so far is we've got 10 virgins and we've been told that there are wise ones and foolish ones. And the difference between them boils down to one simple thing in the story here whether they brought extra oil with them for their lamps or not. Now, we really don't give a great deal of consideration to the fact that they brought extra olive oil with them or not. But if you go back to my video on light, one of the things I bring out there is just how expensive artificial light, something like these little Roman or wick lamps that they used during that time, were to keep lit. So the young women that brought extra olive oil with them for their lights this is an expensive commodity that they brought with them. Now we need to keep in mind that in Matthew 24, verse three, we are explicitly told that this teaching is directed at the disciples. So this distinction between wise and foolish, whether they have olive oil or not, this is something that's being addressed to the disciples. And then Matthew is turning around and when he writes his gospel, he's using it to address his church. This is not talking about the distinction between believers and unbelievers or Jewish people and Christian believers. It has nothing at all to do with that. It's really addressed at those within the church. Are you a wise believer or a foolish believer? And what are the consequences of that within this parable? This brings us now to act two, where the plot really thickens. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, the bridegroom is here, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there won't be enough for you and for us. 
Go instead to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Now the key point in Act 2 is that the bridegroom is delayed a long time. The fact that the bridegroom is delayed a long time is very shocking within this story. This word that's used here to describe he delayed a long time can also be translated as he remained somewhere else. And this really raises the question as to why the groom would delay attending his wedding banquet. Even today, if a groom shows up hours late for the wedding, this is just not done. You just don't do it. You would really want to talk to this person and find out what the heck is going on here. What took you so long? Why did everybody have to wait around? It's just not culturally or socially appropriate. This really raises the big question here in Act 2. Why is he late? And not just a little bit late, but he is late a long time. This delay also illustrates two other things. Because the delay reveals the difference between the wise and the foolish in a very public manner. The foolish ones do not have enough oil to keep their lamps lit. The wise ones do. There is something about the behavior and the choices that the wise virgins made that enabled them to be able to manage this delay in a way that the foolish ones could not. Also note here that it tells us that they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But yet in verse 13, it's going to tell us, stay awake, stay alert, because you don't know that day or the hour. I think one of the things that this parable brings out here is it's not being involved in constant activity, constant readiness for the Lord's return. We still go about living our daily lives, but are we doing it in a wise manner that prepares us to manage the delay before, before the bridegroom returns? Now this delay and the fact that they all fell asleep brings us to a word from our sponsor for this week. Ever have a big deadline that you just really can't seem to get ready for? Feel drowsy? Feel tired? Need to take a nap? Well, I have got some good news for you. That's right. It's coffee. It'll give you that supernatural vigilance so that you can fulfill the injunction to stay awake, stay alert. Not only will it give you that get up and go, but coffee is filled with antioxidants, which are somehow good for your body, sort of and somehow it's biblical. Back to you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. A word right for the moment of need. Act 3. But while they had gone to buy it, the bridegroom arrived, and those who were ready went inside with him to the wedding banquet. Then the door was shut. Later the other virgins came too, saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. And finally, we have the nimshaw or the concluding statement, therefore stay alert because you do not know the day or hour. It's at this point in Act 3 that the foolish ones realize that they are running out of oil and that they are not prepared for the situation. And so they go to the wise ones and they beg of them to give them some oil. The wise ones in return then say no because there won't be enough for you and for us. Now once again, going back to the expense of artificial light in the ancient world, this really reveals something because these women actually realize that the extra oil they brought, this isn't like a whole jug full of olive oil to light their lamps. There's just enough for them to go out and meet the bridegroom and then go into the house. It's just a little bit of oil that enables them to manage the bridegroom's return and safely enter the wedding banquet. The other young women do not have that extra oil, and as a result, they're instructed then to go and buy some oil. Now this suggestion to go and buy some more oil is really odd once again, because we're told that this is midnight. Somewhere around the middle of the night, they're going to go off into their Galilean village or around the streets of Jerusalem and try and find oil to buy. There are no 7-Elevens or 24-hour grocery stores back then. They're going to be banging on somebody's door or a family member 
begging for oil at that time of the night, having to do very in socially inappropriate behavior in order to secure oil so that they can light their lamps and then come back to this wedding banquet. Once they've got the oil, they then go to the house where the wedding banquet is and they bang on the door and they cry out, Lord, Lord, open to us or let us in. And this Lord, Lord in Greek is kurios. It's a phrase that is often used in the Old Testament for Yahweh or for God. When they translated the Hebrew into Greek, they used kurios to refer to the Lord Almighty or the God Almighty. In the New Testament, it's a phrase that's often used to refer to Jesus Christ. So this Lord, Lord may have theological overtones to it. I think it does. But within the context of the story, it's referring to the person who owns the house probably the father of the bride or the bridegroom or a wealthy patron that's providing for this wedding banquet. But this would be the person who owns the house that the five wise virgins and the bridegroom and probably the rest of the wedding party have already gone into. Now, I don't think the main point here is identification of who this Lord is. I think the main point is, is that they are asking to come in. They've gotten the oil. They've gone out of their way and done probably woken a lot of people up to get this oil and now they've come back and they're banging on the door and asking to be let in and the owner or the master of the house whether it's the father or a patron then says to them no i don't know you and this is another really shocking thing in this story it just keeps subverting our expectations here you would expect that whoever the master of this house is if he had set up this wedding feast and he had invited these 10 virgins or 10 young women to be attendants at the feast here, he would know who they are. So why does he say to them that I don't know who you are? This is kind of shocking as well. There's a denial of any sort of relationship between the master of the house and these people outside. And I think that the fact that he denies knowing or acknowledging them is tied to their foolishness or lack of preparation in having enough oil. And it creates a very provocative and challenging moment in this parable. It should shock you and wake you up and go, why is he saying it to these virgins, which is often a very positive term used throughout the Bible, why is he being so negative towards them here, when it seems like the fault really lies with the bridegroom in delaying so long to come? This echoes back and alludes to Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus teaches, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so I think Matthew, the way he phrases and teaches the parable here, really wants you to see that connection between this statement earlier and what's taking place here. That's the lifestyle of the disciples that then create this relationship between them and the Lord. The same thing here. It's the preparation or the lifestyle of these young virgins that then creates the connection with the Lord of the house and allows them admission into it or denies them access and even that the master of the house denies even knowing them. One more point we need to bear in mind with the delay of the bridegroom to arrive for his wedding banquet is that at the end of chapter 24, we have a parable where an owner of a house goes away and leaves his servants in charge. And the master returns earlier than expected and finds his servants abusing their position and they are judged because of it. Now, the shocking point of that parable turns upon this idea that the master of the house returns earlier than he said he would. In this parable, it turns around the fact that the bridegroom comes much later than was expected. So whether the Lord returns early or whether he returns much later, that's not the key thing. The key thing is that we are to be ready at all times because we don't know the day or the hour. The denial of the master not to allow the 10 foolish virgins into the wedding banquet at the end and even denies knowing them is where the thrust or the challenge of this parable lies. Remember, when Jesus is teaching this, he's talking to his disciples. He's not talking about unbelievers or people who reject Christ. He's talking to his disciples. And then Matthew is using it to address the church that he leads. So this parable is being addressed to believers. And the question is, are you a foolish 
or are you a wise believer? How are you occupying the time between now and when the Lord returns? The meaning of this parable brings across this idea that the eschatological reality of our eternal destiny is based upon what we are doing right here and right now. Now is when these end time realities break forth into our daily life. So whether Christ comes sooner or later, the point is, is that what we do and how we live our lives now determines our reality then. Let me see if I can phrase this another way. The meaning of this parable hits the idea that end time realities occur in the midst of our everyday lives. And then verse 13, we get this nimshal, which was a Jewish term that the rabbis used to refer to these summary statements that they used at the end of their parables. And in this case, it says, therefore stay alert because you do not know that day or hour. This ties us back to chapter 24. And chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus says, therefore you must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour that you do not expect. There are a lot of shocking statements or events that occur throughout this parable. And I would love to hear in the comments down below what you think are some of the more challenging or provocative elements in this parable to your lives. The parable of the 10 virgins challenges us and should provoke us to consider our life here and now and how we are living it in light of these end times or eschatological realities. How does the ultimate destiny or eternal reality of your life line up with what you are doing here and now? How are you investing your life, living your life, wisely or foolishly making decisions about how you are setting up your life for these ultimate realities? How does the end of time break forth in your life here and now? I want to close with an illustration from these medieval cathedrals. Oftentimes on the architrave or around the doors on the eastern side of the church, you will find a carving or a depiction of St. Peter holding the keys, referring to admission into the kingdom of heaven. Then on the western side of the church, where the sun sets and goes down, you'll often find a depiction of the parable of the ten virgins. It's on the western side because the sunset brings across the idea of the end of time or that this age has come to an end. And the parable of the ten virgins there on the western door then challenges us when we go out. How are we living our lives in light of Christ's ultimate second return? Now, having blathered on all that time, we get to the point that you've all been waiting for. Who's going to win this English study version Bible? Lucky Chris Ambos writes, I'm a pastor. I'm in need of a study Bible that will help me study the Word of God. The ESV study Bible will help me a lot, specifically with the study nerds. So Chris, I'm going to email you and ask where to send this Bible. Remember, it's got to be to an American address because this sucker is heavy and I don't have the funds to go shipping it around the world. So let me know where to ship, ship this, Chris. And I hope this is something that will be a long-term benefit to you and for your ministry. Until next week, I just want to say, please subscribe. It lets you know when I have new material. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment about what you find provocative in this video or not. And also be sure to share it with other people. Getting this channel and the information out to more and more people is really the reason why I'm doing it. And that's the biggest way that you can help me. Until next week, may the peace of the Lord be with you all.